O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you know what time it is? It's not tool time. It's not night time or Miller time. It's the right time. It's the critical time. We've read enough. We've seen enough. We've frankly had enough. The time for talking is over. So wake up and smell the roses. The time is now. Well, Jesus may not have used those exact words, but that's essentially what Jesus was getting at in Luke chapter 12, which is immediately before our gospel lesson starts. And even though there's a chapter break there, it's all the same speech to the same crowd of people. Jesus says, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat. And it happens. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret what's going on right now? Looking at the news, reading about uh, death and warfare and destruction, we might very well ask, Lord, what's going on right now? What's it mean? Lord, what should we do? Those are difficult and complicated questions, and I think the whole of human history is proof that humankind is very conflicted on how to interpret what God or for others, the gods or destiny are doing. I think intelligent fools try to interpret what God is doing simply through the lens of history. You see, history is a record of what human beings have done. And God is doing something very different than what human beings are doing. There are some times, certainly, where God lets us peek at, at a portion, at some small section of what he's doing, revealed through the prophets in scriptures. And the prophet Isaiah is perhaps the uh, best and most extensive insight offered onto how God works in international politics. Yet even Isaiah, who reveals so much, has this warning. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God's plans and his thoughts, we might even say his policies and politics, are not the same as ours. So if you just want to hear what you already know, you probably don't want to listen to what God says, because his thoughts are not your thoughts, and his ways are not your ways. He's not going to reinforce what you thought you already knew. His ways and his plans are higher. And you know, inscrutable is the fancy or theological word that means you can't figure God out on your own. So don't bother trying too hard or you'll probably hurt yourself. In the New Testament, Jesus never tells us exactly what will happen in, for instance, I don't know about you, but I've been spending more time thinking and reading about international politics. Um, but Jesus does warn us of the kinds of things that will happen. Famines, natural disasters, wars, and rumors of wars. However, he tells us essentially not to freak out because he'll protect his people. To be clear, God's people are those who rely on Christ. Those who rely on Christ in the U.S., in Russia, in the Ukraine, and whoever repents and follows Jesus. 
we may not know what will happen or why it will happen, yet Isaiah does tell us what to do. We don't know what will happen, but we're told what to do. Seek the Lord while he may be found. While he's still there, seek him. Call upon him when he's near. Don't wait till he's far away. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Isaiah tells us to return to the Lord so that God may abundantly pardon us. Now, Isaiah's advice is for the wicked to forsake his policies and the unrighteous man to abandon his old plans. Now, this crowd in Luke, this is all trying to set this up for Luke chapter 13. Luke is the, it's the very same crowd, like I said, that heard Jesus say, why aren't you guys paying it? You know the weather, but you don't see what's going on right in front of you. So since Jesus had um, just told them to pay attention what to, to what was happening right in front of them, some of the crowds, I mean, I think understandably, must have wondered, um, by right now, does Jesus mean current events? And so they asked him about current events, kind of like they asked him for a hot take. Recently, some Galileans, which is where Jesus grew up, remember, had been part of a rebellion. And Pilate had not only killed these men, as a punishment, Pilate had mingled their blood with the temple sacrifices. I mean, this was, this was bloodthirsty. It was deplorable and a, a war crime to the Jewish religion. The violence and injustice bothered the crowd. And some, they're probably, probably a mix, some sympathizers one way or the other, but most were saying, this is terrible. This is crazy, Jesus. What should we do? Well, maybe, like me, you hear about the Ukraine and you say, this is crazy, Jesus. This is terrible. What should we do? It's horrible and it should stop. What should we do next? Where should our focus be? But Jesus' response is not what they expected. It's not what many of them probably wanted to hear. They probably expected Jesus to condemn or curse Pilate and sympathize with those from his hometown of Galilee. It was so heinous. I mean, how could you not start cursing Pilate for this cruel and bloodthirsty reign of terror? But what Jesus says is, do you think these guys were worse than you because of how they were punished? No. But I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or how about those who tragically died in the Siloam Tower collapse? Were they any worse offenders than any others living in Jerusalem? No. But I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This sounds like a response Jesus might give to current political concerns as well. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You see, what Jesus is aiming for is people repenting, abandoning their plans and pursuing Christ's plans of peace and reconciliation. Jesus basically says, these guys, these guys died, but guess what? That's what happens to sinners. They perish. One way or another, human beings die. Or to put it more theologically, the wages of sin is death. You see, we can't win by beating the bad guys or by beating the bad political theory or the bad law. There's no one sin, no one silver bullet that's going to fix this world. The solution is not ending racism, or ending abortion, or any other wicked thing. The solution is coming to the end of ourselves and finding a new beginning in Christ. And Jesus discourages us from seeing the world through a self-righteous lens that hides our own blind spots and highlights others' shortcomings. Jesus refuses here, at least, and seems like a regular thing to me, to endorse or denounce one group as worse than another. You've probably all heard the phrase, we're in it together, right? Well, as Christians, as we read the scriptures, as we come to confess, we might say, we're all sin it together. And fighting over who's worse is foolish. This Thursday morning Bible study came up with this metaphor, and I really liked it. It's, it's like we're all on the Titanic. It doesn't really matter where on the Titanic you are. 
But what matters is getting off the boat. The ultimate go goal is not to find the best spot on the boat because the whole thing is going to sink. It's simple. Repent or perish. Human beings die. The wages of sin is death. This world is wicked and it's broken. So get off the boat and jump ship with Christ. After all, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Where can that eternal life be found? Not in a military victory, not in a political victory or social victory, but in Jesus Christ, crucified and resurrected. The world offers us death in a variety of shapes, sizes, and colors, but in the end, all it can deliver is death. It can't promise us life, but Jesus offers us life, life in him, life through repentance, forgiveness, restoration, and reconciliation. Remember Isaiah's words, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Unless you consider yourself to be righteous, Isaiah calls us all to forsake our ways, to abandon our plans. Rather, he says, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. This world in its present form is passing away, but Christ has come to have compassion on you and me. The gospel of Jesus overcomes all of the worlds and its problems, and it gives us an eternal hope in Christ. And I think that with all that's going on in this world, we could say we've seen enough. We've read enough. We've had enough. God is calling us to action that will give the world exactly what it needs, exactly the transformation it hopes and longs for, an answer that will fundamentally change what is wrong starting with you and me. Repent, every one of you. For the kingdom of heaven has come in Christ, and he comes to have compassion on us. In Jesus' name, amen.